It is big reveal after big reveal, and the groundbreaking events of the reverie are here at last. As we get more information on the circumstances surrounding Nefertari Cobra's death, the meeting between Sabo and Jewelry Bonnie, and the so-called assassination attempt on St. Charles's life, in classic One Piece fashion, nothing is for certain, except that we're in for one hell of a ride. So buckle up, because we're about to delve into all of these recent reveals, and how this will all connect to the current storyline. Let's start with the biggest reveal. Well, somewhat of a reveal, because although Imu's face was not revealed to us, it at least seems that their identity has been revealed to someone outside of the Gorosei. This is by far the most interesting scene in this chapter, the discussion between King Cobra of Arabasta and the Gorosei, a continuation of the events after the reverie and a scene that was planted back in chapter 908, where we learned that King Cobra requested an audience with the Gorosei. In that same chapter, we saw the Gorosei discussing how of the 20 dynasties that would go on to form the world government, the Nefertari dynasty was the sole bloodline that chose to remain in their homeland instead of relocating to Marijoie and hold the title of the Celestial Dragons. We now know that King Cobra's request was to ask two very important and intriguing questions. First, to ask about Queen Lily, and second, the meaning of D. And from this conversation, we delve further into the lore that we learned back in the Reverie arc. The 20 kingdoms that would go on to form the world government, establish the empty throne, and each place the weapon as a vow that they would all be equal and that no one king would rule the world. But because the royal family of Arabasta decided not to follow suit, there are actually only 19 weapons in front of the throne. Arabasta's representative, Queen Lily, Lily was to return to her country, but intriguingly, she never made it back, her existence seemingly vanishing with no record. She did, however, leave a short letter, which has since been passed down the generations of the Nefertari family, the contents of which aren't clear, but supposedly have something to do with the D clan. And the first thing that I want to discuss here are the swords surrounding the Empty Throne. As it's now confirmed, there should be 19 weapons, representing each of the 20 kingdoms, minus one for the Nefertari family. Interestingly, the fact that there should only be 19 weapons doesn't seem to be public knowledge, because when we first told this piece of lore, it was stated that there are 20. But what's even more interesting is that from what I can see, there are only 18 swords. In both chapters 907 and 908, and the panels where all the weapons surrounding the throne are visible, I can only count 18. And to be fair, these panels aren't super duper clear, or Oda may have just decided to not draw all 19, but I do find it a weird coincidence. And here's why. When we see Imu in chapter 908 in the Chamber of Flowers, we see them with a sword, presumably using the sword to slice up or stab photos of Luffy, Blackbeard, and Shirohoshi, with a photo of Vivi in hand, which causes me to think that perhaps this sword is one of the 19, which Imu has taken to use at their disposal, therefore only leaving 18 with the throne. Now the chapter cuts between the conversation about Lily to Imu, showing their likeness in figure, and perhaps cheekily suggesting that Lily and Imu are one and the same. But if there really are only 18 swords in front of the throne with Imu holding the 19th, then this would suggest that Imu actually isn't Lily, and there is another missing sword. But alternatively, if I'm wrong in counting of the swords, and please do comment below if I am, it may well be that Imu's sword is Lily's 20th sword, the sword of Arabasta, and Imu being Lily herself is potentially supported by a lot of other factors, such as Cobra's facial reaction when he first sees Imu, which could just be because he's witnessing someone sitting brazenly on the throne, but it could also be because he's seeing a familiar face if he's able to recognize characteristics of the Nefertari family on Imu, as well as the fact that both Imu and the Nefertari family have been heavily linked to the Lily flower throughout the series. In the Chamber of Flowers, Imu is surrounded by lilies, whereas in chapter 641, we see a cover story where Vivi is visiting her sick father, bringing lilies as a gift. And now, knowing that the former queen was named Lily, well, I can't help but read into the symbolism. Because lilies are a flower that are steeped in deep meaning, often representing purity, innocence, motherhood, and rebirth across a lot of cultures and religions. So for someone named Lily to abandon her kingdom and instead choose to rule the world alone would be a very 
very ironic twist of fate. A big kick in the balls to whoever came up with your name is your virtue. Or alternatively, it could be very fitting if Lily was abducted for her purity and innocence and all that she represents. Remembering that Vivi's photo was the only one that Imu didn't destroy, is it a case where Vivi is now also being sought after by the same person and perhaps for the same reason that her ancestor was 800 years ago? And in which case, there is clearly a trend going on. Luffy is a reincarnation of Joy Boy, Shirohoshi the new vessel of an ancient weapon, Blackbeard could literally be multiple people and now Vivi and Lily? See where I'm getting at? Another really weird coincidence is that in chapter 220, when Luffy, Zoro and Sanji are investigating the Saint Brees wreckage, Sanji finds a picture of a woman with a harpoon through it. Similar to how Shirohoshi's photo has been stabbed by Imu's sword. Which isn't to say that the two are linked in any way, but just an odd detail that I recalled. And if memory serves me right, there has been no further explanation about that woman or her photo since. Anyways, while I can't speak for the relevance of these recent events to what happened to Saint Brees or the Brees Kingdom, I can say with some confidence that all of this new information seems to be highly related to the circumstances of how Vivi came to be on the run. If this letter is passed down from one generation to another, it's more than likely that Vivi knows about this information as well. Or even if she doesn't, it would still be in Imu and the Gorosei's best interest to ensure that anyone with even the slightest chance of knowing what the content of that letter is, is dealt with appropriately. Which seems to be what happened to Cobra. But intriguingly, Imu didn't hesitate to show themselves, which I think says a lot about Imu's personality. As we saw in chapter 1074, Vivi had to borrow the clothes of one of Big News Morgans workers, meaning that it wasn't a smooth escape. Which is also when we saw that they are also accompanied by Wapol, who had something to leak to Morgans after the reverie. Something suggested to also be relevant to all of these big secrets, seeing as he was scared that the world government may be on his tail. Which I was hoping would all connect back to Sabo and what he saw at Marijoie, but instead, chapter 1084 starts with Jewelry Bonnie meeting Sabo, which is a callback to chapter 1061, where we saw Bonnie thinking to herself that she met Luffy's brother while deciding not to tell Luffy himself. And initially when I read that chapter, I thought Bonnie must know the details of what happened with Sabo and the framing of Cobra's assassination, and was only choosing not to break the news to Luffy so as not to spoil the fun that he was having at Egghead Island. But now we learn that Sabo and Bonnie parted ways with no issue whatsoever and it was only after their separation that the big Sabo incident occurred. Not to say that their meeting wasn't a big deal because this is when she told Sabo about being Kuma's daughter and revealing her purpose for going to Egghead. Not to take revenge on Vegapunk for turning Kuma into a cyborg but rather to ask him to restore her father back. Which elicited an interesting reaction from Sabo, which seemed ominous, almost as if he was already aware that there was no way of turning Kuma back to human, but that's difficult to say because Sabo's reaction might have been just about the guards who spotted them instead. And another interesting detail here is that the guards complain about the shortage in manpower, blaming it only on you know what. And we don't find out exactly what that is, but it seems to be this legendary phantom room that the guards are so afraid of, even hesitating to speak of it directly. And with everything else going on, it's likely related to Imu and is perhaps that frozen chamber. Maybe anyone who goes near it has gone missing, therefore the room becoming a legendary cautionary tale never to be spoken of. Or read a different way, it could be one of the guards just trying to scare the other. And in this way, it's a fun detail that provides a nice feeling of normalcy about those who serve the castle. It gives me the same feeling of trying to scare your friend by telling a creepy tale while walking past an old house. But while all of this was going on, chaos ensued with Charlos resuming his attempt to enslave Shirohoshi. But unlike in chapter 907, this time Sai and Leo actually get their hands on the Celestial Dragon, or more appropriately, their feet and tail, adding another very satisfying attack on Charlos for us to witness. And this chaos right here may be one of the most intriguing things to happen, which could have an impact that extends beyond the reverie and marriage war. We already know that this is being treated as an attempted assassination, and that even the Holy Knights had to get involved. And what makes this even more interesting is that this could provide a link between the Holy Knights and the Straw Hats ending up in a promising clash. Only a few chapters before the initial conflict with Charlos started in chapter 907, Luffy was announced an emperor in chapter 903. And one of the biggest factors of him being named a Yonko was the formation of his Grand Fleet. And as Sai and Leo are both representatives
executives of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. An action such as this could further increase Luffy's notoriety as their senior captain. The chances of any punishment being given to Sai and Leo themselves might be in question since St. Mjorsgaard vowed to take responsibility for their actions, but surely this is something that will put the Holy Knights on even greater notice about Luffy. And how the Holy Knights deal with this dispute will indeed be very interesting as what happens to Sai and Leo if they are punished directly with disregard of Mjorsgaard's vow would indicate how much jurisdiction and power the Holy Knights have. What is for certain, however, is that this is big news indeed and an event that could perfectly tie us back into the current storyline. While the recent chapters have taken us away from Egghead Island, the last time we were there in chapter 1078, we witnessed the narration for telling us that the resolution of the impending war between Luffy and his allies and the Marines with Saint Garcia in tow would have a shocking impact that the world never saw coming. And I have to say that these mysterious words are very similar to some other very curious remarks that were made in chapter 800 about the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. The fact that one day they would cause a great incident of historic proportions. Are these commentaries talking about the same thing? Are we soon to witness the earth-shattering incident that no one saw coming? Well, it's too soon to tell, but I do have something to say of my own. You may know that I couldn't react and read this chapter with everyone because I'm sick. And first, what a chapter to have missed out on reading live because this was crazy. But second, it may have been a blessing in disguise that I was sick because it gave me a chance to stay home and do more research after reading the chapter. But most of all, it also got me very emotional. Going through this flashback and seeing more reveals about Imu, the lore and history of the world government, the possibility about the Charlos incident being the catalyst for the great incident of historic proportions. It all feels very end game material to me, which really got me feeling bittersweet. And now maybe I'm just feeling more emotional because I'm sick, but it is getting clear that we really are in the final stretch now. But what a joy it is to read each chapter. And on that sappy note, you've heard enough of me rambling for one day, so thank you for listening as per usual. Leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.